Now, in our last study, we were thinking about the day of Pentecost, and one of the things we were thinking about, trying to learn together, was that Pentecost is a once and for all event. It's like the incarnation of Jesus, it's like the crucifixion, it's like the resurrection, it's like the ascension. It's a non-repeatable event. And yet, at the same time, like the crucifixion of Jesus, like His resurrection, like His ascension, we share in it in some respects. We participate in Christ. So, the Scriptures speak about us being crucified with Christ. The Scriptures speak about us being raised with Christ. Indeed, Paul says in Colossians that we have, in a sense, been ascended with Christ, and our lives are hid with Christ in God. And when He comes again in majesty and power, He will come again and bring us together with Him. So, how do we share in the gift of the Spirit at Pentecost? One of the great books on the Holy Spirit was written by a remarkable Dutchman 100 and so years ago by the name of Abraham Kuyper, The Work of the Holy Spirit. And he has a beautiful illustration there in which he describes a, a town in which a new waterworks has been created. And the mayor comes along, and in all the pageantry, he opens the waterworks, and the water begins to flow once and for all. But then there is a new development built, there are individual houses built, and as those new developments are built and individual houses are built, they are connected to the water supply that was opened once and for all. And this is the way the New Testament teaches us to think about our relationship to Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, Jesus fulfills John's promise, I baptize only with water he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, there takes place the great baptism with the Holy Spirit. But then you remember how Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, all of us who belong to Jesus Christ have also been baptized with the Holy Spirit. We've come in Christ to share in that blessed gift of the Spirit of the Lord Jesus being given to us. And at this point in our studies, we are beginning to turn from thinking about the story of the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the lives of individual believers like ourselves. And so, Jesus says in John 16, 8 through 11, when the Spirit comes, He will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment and this happens on the day of Pentecost. The people hear the gospel, they see the power of the Spirit, they are convicted of their sin, and they come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, the question is, how is the Holy Spirit involved in bringing us to faith in Jesus Christ? And part of the answer to that question is, the Spirit brings us to faith in Jesus Christ by His work of regeneration, by giving us the new birth. And of course, the great passage in which this is discussed in the New Testament is the third chapter of John's Gospel, marvelous description of the conversation between the Lord Jesus and this distinguished Pharisee, Nicodemus, who's described in John 3, 1 as a ruler of the Jews and whom later Jesus describes actually as the great theologian in Israel. John chapter 3, verse 10, Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? So, here is a, a remarkable man. He is a Pharisee. He has, he's deeply committed to the way of righteousness. There's a certain graciousness about him. He, he comes to Jesus, and he, he shows Jesus a certain kind of honor that many Pharisees didn't show. And he is the great theologian in Israel. He is the name on everybody's lips. If you want theological counsel and advice, they immediately think Nicodemus is your man. And yet Jesus says to him, are you the teacher of all Israel? 
and you don't understand what it means to experience the new birth. So, this is, this is an enormously significant thing, and it's also a very striking thing that it's possible to do a great deal in religion, to know a great deal about religion, and yet never to have experienced this regenerating work of the Holy Spirit in which He gives new birth. Bishop Ryle, great Anglican bishop, comments on these verses and says, a man may be ignorant of many things in religion and be saved, but to be ignorant of the matters that are handled in this chapter is to be on the high road that leads to destruction. So, it's vital for us to understand what Jesus means when He says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. You need to be born from above. In our Christian theology and doctrine, the word regeneration features very largely. But it's an interesting thing. I wonder if you know this. The New Testament uses the word regeneration on only two occasions. One occasion in the Gospels when Jesus is thinking about the final regeneration of all things in Matthew chapter 19. So, there the word regeneration means the restoration of the entire cosmos so that it may breathe the glory of God. And the other place, of course, is in Titus chapter 3, where Paul speaks about the washing of regeneration. But although the word regeneration is infrequently used, the language of birth and new birth that brings us into the kingdom of God through the Holy Spirit is very frequently found. And that's why it's so important for us to understand what Jesus is saying. And I want you to notice just four things from this enormously significant passage that will help us to understand the Lord Jesus' teaching. First of all, notice what He says about the origin of this birth. My spiritual mentor in Scotland from the age of 17 onwards was a wonderful minister by the name of William Still. His church stood on the main street of the city of Aberdeen, and he had a huge notice board outside the church, partly because there was a bus stop just outside the church. And you know in Scotland, uh, public transport's wonderful by comparison with many other places. The buses would stop, and people would look out the window, and they would see this notice. And I remember one week he had on this large notice board the words, you must be born an orphan. You must be born an orphan. And people would look at it and think, surely there's a mistake somewhere. Some people even phoned him, which of course was uh, one of the reasons he put the notice board there. What do you mean you must be born anothen? Now, anothen is the Greek word that's used here in John chapter 3, and it actually conveys the idea of something that comes downwards from above. Remember how when Jesus was crucified, the temple curtain was torn in two, and our translations say something like, from the top to the bottom. That's the language that's being used. And even here later on in John chapter 3, when Jesus says uh, these wonderful words, He tells us, He who comes from above is above all, comes from above. So, when Jesus says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again. He means you must be born from above. The birth you've already had, Nicodemus, is a birth that comes from below. You are the, you are the product, doubtless under the providence of God, of the love of your father and your mother. You have had an earthly birth. But Nicodemus, if you're ever going to enter the kingdom of God, you need to have a heavenly birth, and that heavenly birth comes 
through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus emphasizes that, doesn't He, in verse 5, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. And again, in verse 6, he says the same thing, essentially. What's born of the flesh is flesh. Only what's born of the Spirit is spirit. And then he uses this marvelous illustration of the wind blowing. Now, that's significant, isn't it? Pneuma means both wind and spirit. Uh, he says, you, how, do, how, do you, how, do you, how do you understand the wind? It's invisible, but you see its effects. And in the same way, it's true of anyone who is born of the Spirit of God. Now, what's he teaching Nicodemus? He's teaching Nicodemus essentially this. There are no resources down here on earth to make you the new man you need to be if you're going to be part of God's kingdom. You have been born of the flesh, but you need to be born from above, born of the Spirit. So, the origin of this new birth is found in the Holy Spirit who will come down to us from above. We have no resources in ourselves to give ourselves the new birth. The Holy Spirit has all of those resources, and only He can give us the new birth. Second, this picture that Jesus draws teaches something about the bestowal of the new birth, how it's given to us. Remember what He says again here in verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it's come from. You don't know where it's going to. You can almost imagine the scene there. They're sitting there in the evening. The wind is getting up, and perhaps there's some trees outside the house where Jesus is. And the, you can almost imagine the, the wind blowing and the rustling of the leaves and Jesus saying, Nicodemus, it's like that. It's only when you see the effect on the leaves of the wind that you, that you know which way the wind is blowing, because the wind blows wherever it wills, and so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, we could misunderstand these words, say, uh, because we know Christians, say, uh, and nobody seems to know where they come from, and nobody seems to know where they go to, and they could be misunderstood to say, you know, the work of the Spirit makes you a free spirit. That's not what Jesus means at all. What Jesus means is that the wind is not under your control. The wind does not obey the desires of the leaves. The wind blows sovereignly, and so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. This is an absolute sovereign work of God to which we contribute absolutely nothing. The new birth, God Himself, by His Spirit, does sovereignly. And this is actually the teaching of the rest of the New Testament. We find this in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, and it's echoed in James chapter 1 and verse 18 of His own will, God begat us that we might be a kind of first fruits of His creatures, of His own will. That's uh, humbling, isn't it? Uh, do you know we still have lingering in our Christian world the notion um, that uh, God does 70% of it, or 90% of it, or 98% of it, but there's always something that you need to contribute. You can contribute no more to your new birth than you contributed to your first birth. What did you contribute to your first birth? Did you decide to be born? Isn't that an astonishing thing? You know, when you begin to think about it, and to think, I might not have been were it not for the desire of others, if it were not for the activity of others. I am not self-generated. Actually, 
John had made this clear earlier on in the prologue to the gospel when he had spoken in chapter 1 and verse 12 about those who come to believe in Jesus, who receive the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, this is a heavenly birth given through the Spirit. It's a sovereign birth given through the Spirit. And it's also, in the third place, a transforming birth. It has very decided effects in our lives. Remember again the little illustration, the wind blows, you don't know where it's come from, you don't know where it's going, but you hear its sound, you know it's present by its effects. How do we know that we've been born again? We, can, we can't look inside and say, oh, there goes the Holy Spirit giving me new birth, any more than we could have said at our, at our own conception, oops, I'm being conceived, or at our own birth, oh, I'm being born. No, we know we've been born because of the results, the effects of that birth. I want you to notice several striking effects that Jesus points out in His teaching to Nicodemus. First of all, in verse 3, I say to you, unless you are born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Now, the implication is that once you are born again, you do see the kingdom of God. You see the power of God. You see that Jesus is king in His kingdom. The, uh, the dying thief was born again on the cross and turns to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when you enter your kingdom. The problem we have is that because of our sin, our minds, our understandings are darkened and we can't see the kingdom of God. And actually, Nicodemus is a, a prime illustration of that, isn't he? Jesus gives him this teaching, and uh, Nicodemus says, how can a man be born again when he's old? And you, do, you, do, you, do you see what he's saying? Jesus says, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, Jesus, I can't see that. I don't understand that. His mind is closed and darkened and he can't take it in, but regeneration will illumine that mind so that he will see. Luke 24 is a beautiful illustration of how that happens, isn't it? The two on the road to Emmaus, and they, they didn't recognize Jesus. And then as Jesus speaks to these darkened minds and distressed hearts, their hearts begin to burn within them, and they begin to see Jesus and recognize His kingdom. So, regeneration, the new birth, illumines our darkened minds. Regeneration also, verse 5, liberates our enslaved wills. Jesus said, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He isn't able to enter the kingdom of God. You know, sometimes people say to you, well, I'll, I, this gospel is very interesting. I'll, I'll put it off till later because I, I know later on I can do it. I, I sometimes say, well, show me that you'll be able to do it then by doing it now. Just will yourself to enter the kingdom of God. And you can will yourself to will and will and will but you can't enter the kingdom of God because your will is bound. You are a slave. You are in bondage. But when the Holy Spirit comes and gives new birth, one of the glorious realities is you begin to will what you had realized you could never will yourself. Put it very simply, you want Jesus, and you didn't want Jesus before. And there's something else here, I think. Isn't it interesting that Jesus speaks here about being born of water and the Spirit? What do you think He means by being born of 
water and the Spirit. Well, some people think that uh, it's just a reference to ordinary birth. Unless you're born normally, and then you're born of the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. But that would be a truism, wouldn't it? I mean, if you hadn't been born normally, you wouldn't be here. So, what is Jesus saying? I think He's referring back to that prophecy in the book of Ezekiel when God says He's going to pour out His Spirit on people, and He'll sprinkle clean water on them, and they will be clean. And He's speaking here not so much about the illumination of the mind or about the liberation of the will, but about that transformation that takes place in our affections so that we are clean. We have this sense that we belong to the Lord, and our, our affections, our desires are no longer directed downwards, but they are directed Christwards. One of my fellow countrymen, Thomas Chalmers, great figure in the 19th century, preached a sermon. It is a truly great sermon, but it's the title of the sermon that has attracted most notice more than the content of the sermon. The title of the sermon was The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. And that's what happens, isn't it? Um, I wasn't brought up in a, in a Christian home. My folks didn't start coming to church until after I was converted. But I was brought up in a home that was Sabbatarian. Although we never went to church, there was no gospel in it, but there was a lot of law in it. And so Sunday was the worst day in the whole week for me. I just, I, I, it was boring, it was long, there were at least 48 hours on Sunday. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to do anything, but there wasn't any gospel in place. And then I remember when I was converted, it was one of the most, it wasn't, it wasn't something I worked up, it just happened that this day became the best of all days. And it's been that way ever since because of the transformation of the affections. But there's something else to notice here, and we mustn't ever lose sight of it. The effect of the new birth is our minds are illumined, our wills are liberated, our affections are transformed. But all this is so because the new birth brings us to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we must never separate the teaching that's given in John 3 on the new birth from the teaching that's given in John 3 about believing in Jesus Christ. Sometimes people separate John 3, 16 from John 3, 1 through 15. And sometimes people separate John 3, 1 through 8 from John 3, verse 16. But they belong together, don't they? God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the first and the great sign that we've been born again by the Holy Spirit not that we look downwards and inwards and say, oh my, I've been born again. We can think about that later on, but that we look outwards to the Lord Jesus, and we come in faith to trust Him and to serve Him and to love Him. You know, I think it's always a mistake when you're teaching to assume that everyone who hears the teaching is already a Christian believer. And so perhaps this is the point in our studies on the ministry of the Holy Spirit to ask the question, have you been born again? How would you know? You would know because you'd come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, thank You that You have given Your Holy Spirit to open our eyes, to set free our wills, to transform our affections, and bring us to faith in Jesus Christ. Work that work more and more throughout the world, we pray. And in us who study these verses together, we pray that we may ourselves see the effects of new birth in the new life of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And we ask this for our blessing and for His glory and in His name. Amen.